Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Joran uh, here for a very special uh, entry in the podcast that I co-host with uh, Shane Smith. It's the Shadow Moses Cafe, if you haven't heard of it or listened. Uh, we actually got a chance to interview David Hayter, which is really awesome. Um, there was a slight snafu with the Zoom recording and stuff, so basically I re-recorded my part, but um, it seems to work fine and uh, there are I think you'll you'll agree that it's it's relatively seamless. So, um, sorry that it took uh, like two weeks for me to uh, <laughs> to finish this. I was just uh, I did a couple of versions. I just wanted to make sure I don't know that it it fit the original enough so that it wouldn't seem really awkward or something. So it'll probably will still seem a little awkward because I re-recorded it, you know. But whatever, let's just roll with it. All right, so. Enjoy this. I certainly enjoyed uh, interviewing him, and uh, let's roll. Uh, Welcome back to the Shadow Moses Cafe. I'm your host, Shane Smith. And I'm Joran Lee, and we have a very special guest this time. It's David Hayter. David Hayter! Hello. Shadow Moses Cafe. What the hell? (laughs) Oh my god, I love Star Wars The Old Republic. (laughs) <laughs> That's not Star Wars. Right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I was just, so That's my my husband's actually idea. my husband's actually playing through that right now. Oh yeah. And yeah, so he's like he'll sit on the couch and like he's got this, this super fancy computer. He's like playing Star Wars. He'll probably go on it and like obviously like your voice will come in and like <laughs> um, I'll just like look over and he looks over at me. <laughs> and it's just so funny. It's like is that David here? That's, like, uh, that's funny. You know they. I've been doing that job for about 12 years and, and they asked me, they were like, you know, d- do it with no gravel, um, you know, so that it doesn't sound like snake. So that was fine. And I was doing my, you know, my sort of clean Jedi voice. And then I just got older and my voice got naturally more raspy and now I can't help it. So I like to call I, it I, the hurgle. The hurgle? The hurgle is like my favorite yeah. way to call it. Oh. <laughs> the good yeah. old MGS4 hurgle. <sighs> That's the good yeah. one. Yeah, Chris Zimmerman, our director, would she just give me directions like, um, "Could you make it more snaky?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> make it more snaky." I can't do the snake voice. I'm not even going to pretend to do so. No, but, well, I appreciate that. Uh, we're <laughs> we're here at the cafe. I'm having aloe vera. Um, I don't know what all of you guys are drinking. I don't know. I don't. Moonshine. All I have is. Uh, uh, hand sanitizer <laughs> don't drink that <laughs> no i probably won't unless i get super thirsty oh my god if you want to like because we can like we're gonna like edit this as we go if you want to like get up get something to drink mm-hmm. need to step away at any point yeah, like, come we back can edit that out thing, and everything, yeah. so i appreciate that <laughs> I'm, I'm all right for the moment all right jordan did you want to start with your question first probably a good idea wouldn't it yeah, I guess my first question uh, was something along the lines of, do you find it difficult uh, to keep Snake fresh, you know, playing the character for so long, uh, having to play him through so many iterations? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the nice thing about the Metal Gear games is, you know, there's a lot of emotion to them. There's a lot of, you know, character interaction. And and the thing that I think is really compelling about Snake is he really, you know, feels things. He really, you know cares for his friends and and wants to save the world and yeah. he's not just yeah. a, like a stony tough guy and so even though I like on the outside he wants to pretend that he's a yeah he wants tough to pretend guy. that he is but he just can't <laughs> stop himself if if somebody's in danger or, or whatever and i think that endlessly frustrates him so you know there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to to snake and i also think he you know can be incredibly funny in his seriousness and so no, you know, working on it since you know, 1998, I feel like I've found a lot of layers to him, and plus he's just you know he's just a part of me now. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not like it's not like he's just having frozen conversations. It's you know he can engage you and communicate and. Oh, say, what I the hell? What kind of question is that? I love. <laughs> well, we were just like I think in a previous episode we were just like joking about how. Um, like when Snake, Solid Snake talks to Raiden at the end of 2 mm-hmm. and Snake is saying like find something to believe in and when you find it you know, that's it's all for you and then we were joking like, where the hell did that come from? And it's like, that doesn't feel like, it, it feels like Snake but it doesn't because it's like he's being super philosophical and then Raiden says like, well what am I supposed to believe in? And then Snake comes back he's like, that's your problem. That's and your it's like, problem. 
It's like my favorite thing. Yeah, that's pretty good. Question two was... David. Did you enjoy playing part in the MGS2 character swap ruse? What was it like having to perform Snake, you know, at a distance and more veiled behind the persona of Iroquois Pliskin? Now for his answer. Well, uh, we were recording it, and we recorded it uh, pretty much in order, that one. And um, so we did the, the tanker incident first. And, uh, and then... Raiden came into it, and he started talking about how the buttons work and whatever. I was like, "Why is Raiden telling the player how the buttons work?" And they're like, "Oh, because the um, because from here on out, the people won't play as Snake; they'll play as Raiden." I was like, yeah. "How okay, did well, you feel about that?" Well, nobody mentioned it to me going into it. Now, you know, when you get hired as an actor, there's a lot of things people don't bother to mention to you, so <laughs> that's fine. But I was like, I don't think that's a great idea. I feel like people want to play as a snake, but uh, but whatever, you know. And I went along with it, did the job, and it was a great game. And uh, but then, of course, you know, everybody complained. Well, not everybody complained, but a lot of people complained. They're like, Plenty you know, I wanted to play as, as snake. So uh, so he was back in Metal Gear Three, back where he needed to be. Hell yeah! But it was still it, really fun. I had I had a lot of fun with Quentin. You know. Quentin Flynn uh, playing Raiden and and uh, being the crusty mentor was, was sort of fun. <laughs> I think it, it benefited. It benefited Snake in the long run, like as it's been years along now, like because you put Snake in this like third person, and because when you play as Snake, you kind of superimpose yourself as Remember, Snake, so you this, feel this like Snake. So when yeah. you see Snake making his own, you know, choices, movements, dialogue, it's like you're this whole other person. Wow, and. It totally. So I love working with Shane. She knows what she's talking about with Snake with these games. Right. She's badass. Well, looks like I'm talking again. Okay, okay. Uh, from what I can basically remember of this question, it was basically a follow up one to the MGS2 stuff, and it was just, uh, it was more of just an observation, I guess, about how you know s s compared to MGS1, you know, because we're not playing a Snake anymore. That is might be why we see this more idealized version of him, or this more um, I, avuncular or like uncle like, you know, a snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's nice because it's not really him that's under pressure in the game. So, uh, you know, whereas you know, Solid in, in in Metal Gear One is just constantly, you know, having to deal with trauma. What is or, happening? You know, save the world or dealing with Meryl's backside, you know, oh my all, God. The, all the various, <laughs> all the various things you had to do in that game. Oh. I remember that walk. <laughs> it was like so funny, like, because Snake is like seen as like this dense guy who's like, cause, like what Otacon is like, where would Meryl go? Like, where's one place Meryl would go in the whole base? Obviously the women's bathroom, but Snake's like, I don't know. And Otacon's like, are you stupid? Like, <laughs> <laughs> He didn't say it like that, but it's like it's stuff like that. That's like makes me laugh. Yeah, um, well, Otacon's the thinker, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure, for sure. Snake is more of a reactor. That's true. That's true. Um, what is your favorite snake to play in terms of story and emotion? Hmm. Good question. Uh, well, I, you know, people ask me that all the time. They're like, what, "What was your favorite game to record, or or whatever?" You know, it's all the same to me. I mean, I love. I just love playing the character. I mean, I, I just love doing voiceover jobs. So, you know, if I'm behind the microphone, I'm pretty happy. Um, you know, I think, like, it was harder to play uh, uh, Old Snake because uh, he was falling apart. And, you know, it was yeah, just a lot more difficult physically to pull off. Um, but then Naked Snake in, uh, in uh, Snake Eater... He, you know, he, that was kind of the coolest because he was unburdened by history. You know, it was like his first big adventure out and, and, um, you know, he's young, he still believes in things and, you know, he just had a little more fire to him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and confidence and, you know, yeah. wasn't, wasn't sort of beat down and tired the way, the way Solid is when we first meet him. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. so that was, so that was pretty fun. It was nice to, it was nice to play sort of a younger, more naive snake or, or more confident more you know i'm excited to get into three and the subsequent games after that with you 
Oh boy. Okay, I'm starting to talk again. Okay, I'm laying something out like I'm like I'm laying down a pizza on the table. Um, lots of gestures. Those are helpful. Um, I'm gonna have to hear what they said. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Well, the process is just trying to find. You, ah, you know, ah, snake. Ah, ah, okay, this one was easy. This one, I'm pretty sure I wrote down. Uh. I think it was just essentially what was your process being old snake and you know I, I i just wanted to focus on that role in particular because i mean david Hayter is great as all the snakes but i mean i think that even his most diehard fans would admit that performance in four was by far the, the, the most involved you know and i think when you think about how like extreme that role is to have to play somebody who rapidly aged and not only that but this character that people love so much and that you've played for so long i w was curious about his process so that's what i asked all right now the response uh, well, yeah well the process is just trying to find you know snake and naked snake and everybody they're like you know some people say oh they should have different different voices and i'm like well they're clones you know like i sound almost exactly like my father um a lucky bastard and uh, <laughs> so um so you know the vocal cords are, are the same but it's a matter of where they are emotionally so like i say you know when when solid was picked up he was retired and he didn't want to come back and he was you know bitter about it and when naked snake goes out you know, he's he's on top of it. He's like raring to go. He wants to go out and kick ass. And then when Old Snake comes into it, it's it's the voice itself is deteriorating, and his vocal cords are falling apart. And uh, so it's just <coughs> excuse me. It's just a matter <laughs> of uh, figuring out where um, where his energy is, where his attitude is, where his body is. You know, Old Snake always does it for me. Like. Four is my favorite Metal Gear Solid game. Um, oh my god! You recently, not not like recently, recently, but like fairly recently, replayed it. How was that for you? It was awesome. It's you know, it's such a great game. It was shorter than I remembered, uh, um, but it was really, it was really cool. There were so many things that I had forgotten, and you know, things. There's, there's also you know storylines with uh, Otacon and Naomi and. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, this and that. And they recorded those when I wasn't there. So I, you know, those ones I don't really remember quite as clear, clearly. So it's, it's, you know, it all came back to me uh, playing it again. And then, you know, when you go, like, when you go back to Shadow Moses, is is so cool. And fighting Metal Gear Ray against Metal Gear Rex is just badass. And oh my it's God, really, that's like the really best fun. part. That's it's the really best fun. part. And uh -oh. it's, tra you know, and it's tragic. The the the, the story is just so sad and lovely and oh yeah it's a nice farewell for old snake it's my favorite because it like it wrapped everything up it wrapped everything up because like at the end of like a lot of metal gear games it's like cliffhangers it's like oh what the heck did ocelot do and you know like a whole bunch of questions but then in four it's like this gets answered this gets answered this gets answered right. and at the end of it, Snake, like at the after credit scene when Snake is like giving up the cigarettes and goes off to live with Otacon and Sunny. Uh, it, it's like, it's to me, it like hits the hardest because it's like he had this horrible, long, hard life that you have portrayed beautifully. And like you feel the emotion and the hurt in his voice when he has to like do shit he doesn't want to do. Yeah. And especially like the hired hit scene, right? Like he does not want to go out and fight liquid ocelot. He doesn't want to go and eliminate liquid like that. That's right. not like, even though he, in his younger days when he was working for the CIA um, and he was like pretty much a hired killer for, and that's where like they, like during Metal Gear Solid 1, they're like, oh, you're just like the boss. No, you're worse. Like you're, you're a monster. You're a demon. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to solid and that's because like when he was working for the CIA he just killed indiscriminately for whoever oh, I didn't even know that yeah you know, things about him, <laughs> that's that's the other part about this podcast is like we talk a lot about lore and um She's right. this is the part where I segue where I ask um have embrace. you played or at least watched Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 the MSX games 
No, I, I, I know they exist and I know basically where they're set, uh, but, uh, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I never had, a, never had a console to play them and uh, I didn't want to sit and watch the gameplay. <laughs> Oh man, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I don't blame you. But you know what sucks is like I could just say play it on the HD collection because it's on the MGS3 title screen, but you can't even play it on the HD collection because they took it down. No, no, really? Uh, yeah, they took it off of uh, PS Plus and yeah, all that stuff, and it's just like it, you should have been there on Twitter. It was a debacle. Like everybody I was, I know was just like screaming. I had like a three hour long Twitter space just like talking about it. It was absolutely horrible. I was... Oh, God bless you. Um, <laughs> is it still on the DVD? Or on the on the disc? I think I still have it. Oh, of course it's on the disc. If you own it physically, that's why I was saying, like, because um, consoles... So I have a PS5, but I have the disc version. Um, yeah. But there's a digital version, PS5, right? So, like, if you just want digital games. But that's the whole problem with, like, digital... Yeah, then they take them away from you. And yeah. That's what, you don't own them. That's... I have yeah, every I don't game. Like this digital only nonsense. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of like in that sense where like still millions play digitally only, but like yeah, when they take it away from you, it feels like you don't really own anything. I have all the games physically. Um, I was only gonna segue because I wanted to know your opinion about uh, John Big Boss and his fall into villainy because I was gonna say like, have you played Peace Walker? <laughs> and <laughs> like, um. I don't know how to like fall into that because my favorite thing to do on Twitter is to get into fights about people who think Big Boss is like this amazing, like super good guy. Right. And he's yeah, not. Yeah, no, he goes, he goes right off the rails. I mean, that's why, that's why, you know, people ask me if I prefer Solid Snake or, or Big Boss. And I always say Solid because, mm -hmm. you know, Big Boss really went wrong and, and uh, did a lot of bad things in, in the world and, and, you know, Solid was just sort of born into this thing, paying for the sins of his father. So, uh, Ooh, so I have a lot more sympathy for for Solid than uh, than for Big Boss. I like Young Big yeah. Boss, and I enjoyed. Look, I love playing him in, in uh, Peace Walker. I, I love that uh, such a good game. That game and that performance, I, I was really happy with. And um, so, but uh, but yeah, I don't I don't respect his choices in his older age. You've just validated me. Like, I cannot wait to release this episode and be like, see? <laughs> I told you. Ah. Now, this this was a good question. See, I redeemed myself a little bit with the questions. I gave... This is typically, I think, how I come off to people, is that I seem very disorganized. I seem very crazy. But sometimes I'm crazy like a fox, and I ask some good questions. <laughs> so, um, this time... I believe that I just asked, um, yeah, I mean, is it daunting acting only with your voice? Were there any big scenes where you found it difficult to get inside Snake's head and bring the performance to life that you had to workshop? Um, typically, you don't have time to workshop it. I mean, usually what happens is they give you the script when you get into the booth. And so when you're hearing... Yeah, when you're hearing me say the line, I'm crazy. It's usually the first time I'm reading. Them. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I don't get to rehearse. The first game they nuts. gave me the script in advance, but uh, but for the subsequent games, you just walk in and whatever is on the page, you just do it. So you're a legend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, people don't people don't really grasp how difficult it is to feel your way through a scene the first time you read it and and make it work. You know. Oh, um, and I'm guessing, like, when they give you the script, there's not, like, that. a TV showing the game at all. Like, you're just reading the lines as given to you. Ah, oh. Infiltrator. Someone in the background. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Nothing I but trouble. Star. Was it a girl or Here a boy? Go. It was a girl. Skull King Remelia. about it. Smoking, yes. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm sorry, what was your question? I got the question. I'm sorry. I'm not scared. <laughs> but, I mean, but, like... Um, and I told her too. She's the one I trusted. So I was like, "Please stay in your room. I'm begging you." Right. Um, I'm I'm saying like since it's like the first time you see these lines, um, yeah, you don't have like a TV showing the game. Like they just it's just the lines. Um, maybe four or for Metal Gear One. Well, sort of. It was always different. So for Metal Gear One, we had the TV running the scene because okay. the game was already done. So we'd watch the Japanese. Movie. 
for Metal Gear 2, it was just, it was just waveforms. So we'd look at the Japanese waveform, the length of the line, and try to match that. Um, that sounds so much harder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very hard. And you don't, you can't see what they're doing or whatever. And I, so then I said, look, I really want to be able to see what Snake is doing because he, you know, I don't know if he's moving. I don't know if he's running. I don't know if he's lifting himself up or, you know, whatever. So I can't remember what we did so on, on three, but on four, on four, they had the unfinished footage of the Japanese actors in the mocap stage so we were watching japanese actors in the ping pong ball suits oh my god um you know <laughs> climb on to helicopters made out of two by fours and stuff like that but i could you know i could watch the snake <laughs> actor and he'd climb up doing a line and i could put the effort into it because i could see what he was doing at least but it was hilarious and then the best part of that this was crazy before, crazy uh drebin has a monkey who's love always love always little drinking. gray yeah, it was always gray, of course. Coke. Well, that was a guy. That was a Japanese guy in a mocap <laughs> suit that they just shrunk. So the whole time he's like, you know, <laughs> you know, and he's burping. Not while I'm oh, drinking. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. No, it's so funny. It was so funny. And, uh, yeah, he's like, ooh, 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 you know, popping around the set. Oh my god, that that waveform one. That, I'm gonna be thinking about that for a while. Waveform, just like just the audio, and you had to match that up. Just a just a visual of the audio. So yeah. it's just it's the Japanese line and how long it takes to be said. But also, as you know, the simplest thing in Japanese can take twice as long. Oh, to yeah. say as it does in English. So you know, it was like the the, the the lines didn't fit, and you had no idea what was happening on screen. And, you know, these scripts are difficult enough to understand. If I recall, you, know, you like, couldn't change anything about the script either. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I asked, I asked, uh, you know, I would ask now and again and say, can we change this, this? Normally they'd say no. And, and that's fine. I typically, you know, if you hire me as an actor, you're not hiring me as a writer. I just, you know, if I have an idea, maybe I'll throw it out. But for the most part, I just do the job that they hire me for. Um, but to your question, Joran, the only time I had trouble selling it was the only time I really argued with them is the scene at the end of Metal Gear 4 where Snake is in the cemetery and takes out his pistol. Uh. He puts it in his mouth and it cuts to black and bang, like that. And then later we fade in and he's fine. And I was like, what did he miss? You know, like, <laughs> like, well, because it was like, I was like, okay, so either he missed or he decided not to shoot himself, but shot the gun anyway at, at what I don't know. And I was like, plus, if Solid Snake was going to off himself, he was just off himself. Like, it really annoyed me that, like, you know, for a guy that killed this many people, it's mm. really sort of cowardly to go, I'm going to kill myself. Oh, I don't, I, I can't do it. Like, well, I think it's because he loved life so much. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And this is the part where I make an ass out of myself again by trying to make some kind of convoluted argument about how he could have pulled the trigger. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's going to explain my argument. It wasn't that's very a, good. That's a, that's, a, that's a very optimistic uh, interpretation. Of the, of but it the also movie. makes like great cinema when, like, of course, he's, he missed. And then he's like heaving on the ground. And then no, all I don't of a sudden... I don't want to. I don't want to do it. Oh, I've already pressed too hard. Bang! That that's what I thought happened. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, everybody, slow the train down. I'm going to explain what I actually said. And David is still right. It's pro you know, I mean, he's the screenwriter, right? <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not going to argue with the guy. I mean, he's both Snake and the screenwriter. Uh, and he plays games, and so he knows what would be you know appropriate for Metal Gear, and uh, but. Just so you guys know what I pitch it as, is that I was thinking that he's got the gun in there, and, but not, f see, that's the problem, is that when you see that freaking gun, it is like, boom, I mean, uh, it's pretty, it's, it's lodged in there pretty good, so uh, the idea that he could somehow like, oh no, boom, you know, it doesn't make any damn sense, but uh, 
Since this interview, I came up with an even more crazy interpretation, which is like, you know, they're always deceiving you in Metal Gear. Well, maybe the it's our mistake for assuming there's a connection between the sound that we hear over black. Like, it's intentionally misleading, but uh, it's just violating, like, the cardinal rule, I guess, of writing, which is, like, you never tell a lie, like, a full-blown lie. I mean, I think about movies or, or, like, stories. I mean, usually, unless it's a dream sequence, you know, have a, a a sequence that the 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 story then negates and that's david's point is like that's very unorthodox to put it in a nice way right but i just think you know since it's a spy story and it's all about lying and deceit and i don't know it doesn't really make sense i'll give it to him and, and she's trying to save my bacon here by saying it makes good cinematic sense and i she's got a point but ultimately i bet that was kind of difficult to sell i mean it, it clearly was all right let's let's continue <laughs> that button doesn't work. But it does make great cinema when he's like, you know, he like missed and he's like sweating buckets and then Big Boss is there and he's like, what's good? And, you know, that that happened. He didn't say that, but you know what I mean. Basically. But, <laughs> uh, Big Boss. Big Boss. Big Boss. Uh, and then I'm just talking to God only knows what I'm saying now. It's... Nobody ever, nobody ever complained about it. it. It made perfect sense to everybody, but I'm like, I'm like, oh, no, yeah, yeah. the gun is in his mouth. I was basically just saying, you know what, now that you mention it, that doesn't make any damn sense. So. <laughs> we cut to black. There's a gunshot. And it's like, how do you... You would have been satisfied of Snake dying right there? Not necessarily, but I'm... But but it's a false moment. Like I would mm, never, yeah. as a screenwriter, See. you can't you can't do that. It yeah. doesn't make any. It makes no sense. Um, well, and, it, and I thought it was it fought against the character. It just I didn't respect the the mood. Either you do it or you don't do it. Um, I can respect that. So now that I didn't get a good enough chance to follow back on. That's a really damn good point. And I guess that was his whole point all along, more than it just being like a violation of screenwriting. It's a violation of Snake's character, and that, I mean, look, I'm obviously not some kind of special forces guy whatsoever, but I mean, yeah, obviously those guys, they kind of train him to, you, you're going to pull the trigger to shoot, or you're not, and he's right. Again, he's right. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that just to kiss his ass. Like, if I thought he was wrong, I would at least say it, but no, I, I think, he, I think he, it's a weird moment that is really the only way they can get out of the whole, well, they had the trailer to set it up that he was going to kill himself. Um, um, I can knows? respect that. I can respect so, it, too. Uh, so that was the only thing that really, uh, you know, as a writer, I was like, I was like, this doesn't work at all. But, but you know, but what do I know? Nobody nobody cared. Nobody brought it. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to ask, like, other the than only that. Only one can... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, like, other than that moment and forth, like, is there any other moment where you're like, this does not work? Or, like, is there any change we can make to this line? Um, if not, that's totally cool. But, like, if you can remember. Yeah, well, there, there, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't remember anything specific. But there were certain things that, that like, in the Japanese translation didn't quite make that much sense and so you know and i speak a little japanese so i'd say well what's the original what's the japanese dialogue and then they'd say and i'd say well can't we do it closer to this um and you know sometimes that would work but it was a whole process you know they had to call tokyo to get any changes approved yeah. normally they wouldn't do it so you know a few times i've heard this i've heard this so mostly i just resigned myself to saying you know this is a strange world and strange things happen and just sell it as best you can and um, you know, and, and in the end, that's part of the joy of Metal Gear. You know, it is weird and it is unusual. It's not, it's not written the way I could write it. It's written the way only Kojima could write it. So, yeah. you know, if he wants to talk about fried eggs, we talk about fried eggs. If he wants and he did. And they did talk about, you know, genome soldiers or whatever. This was sort of a kind of a return, but more of an elaboration on a question. I guess I kind of asked earlier. Uh, th th this time I was asking about that balance again and, you know, the tone of the character and how, because anytime you hear him, I mean, it's Snake. And I'm, it's just, when you think about that, it's it just seems like it would be difficult to, 
zero in so so well on what the care and, and even sometimes you know david has to modulate it if it's like snake versus monkey he's got to make it a little more you know for kids or or old snake may, having to make him it, just these little changes through each game uh yeah i guess i was just wondering about the tone of the character so i knew that this was going to have sort of an anime well a very japanese sensibility and sometimes that could be hyper serious sometimes that could be goofy sometimes that could be you know, very, very cutesy, you know, and, yeah. and, and I love all that. And I, I started my voiceover career doing anime dubs. So I felt like this was more, especially in the beginning when he didn't have a face, when it, when it didn't look as realistic, I felt like this needed uh, a bit of a, like an anime feel to a certain extent. Not that we weren't taking it seriously, but that we were taking seriously things that, would surprise somebody in the real world, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. Um, and that we were living it believably. And then, you know, that puts you in some weird positions when you're talking about Santa Claus. And <laughs> that. He's real. You I mean the you. best <laughs> tape in Peace Walker? Right? <laughs> oh my God. Just to bring what you presents I, when I was a kid. What I do know is that Nora tracks his truth. <laughs> yeah, that's proof to him. So Every you, Christmas you know, we go through this on Twitter. <laughs> it's the best thing course. ever. Yeah, um, so, I so yeah, so that's the key is just to say, you know, if this was the real world, what are the rules we're getting of this world from the dialogue, from the from the gameplay or whatever, and then, you know, you go into it with as much heart and commitment and belief as you possibly can. Yeah. I'm going to read a question from one of our Patreons, uh, Johnny Flores Jr., who is a king, by the way. This guy supports us, like every damn day i think we tweet anything and he quote tweets it like within seconds nice. shout out to you johnny you're amazing um yeah, well done johnny <laughs> he's probably gonna love that uh Seriously, he says you, this johnny. one has probably been asked before but how did it feel emotionally to know that big boss rejected his clone sons outright referred to them as monsters and have said uh and to have said monster come to battle the father and have said monster come to battle the father Oh, I see. Um, I, I, to I forgot five. he said it. <laughs> yeah, it was a reference to five. I hasn't, think hasn't been eaten away at me or anything. Oh, you know. I know exactly the game he's coming. It's from it's from V. Yeah. Oh, from V. Oh, yeah. No, I, I wasn't in V. So I didn't play yeah. it. Um, yeah. Uh, as far as him, I I don't think Snake would care much what his test tube daddy said about him. Mm, uh, test tube daddy. Gets, I don't think he gets too hung up on that sort of thing, but I don't know. No, it wasn't my game. So who knows? I certainly yeah. don't. And this is, I think, when it... Oh, yeah, Liquid cares. Liquid's like, oh, yeah. Liquid's oh, all see. insecure and everything. And and so that's like, more Liquid's whatever. thing, caring and about Liquid, boss. Yeah. Liquid was in V, which was crazy. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, and this is when it starts. Basically, I just asked... But I murdered Liquid, or was he somebody else's elbow? <laughs> You technically did murder Liquid. I, I don't get me into it because it's like this whole ocelot thing, and like, was he faking it? Was he not faking it? Was he just fooling the Patriots? Blah 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 blah. Right, right. And I would we would be here for hours, and you killed him. Yes, I would have to disagree <laughs> with that. I think it's not that complicated. Really. Yeah, he's just faking. Right. They they tell you at the end of four, he's just faking. But here, at least that's my read, but here is when I ask him the big question about the Phantom Pain, even though I know he didn't play it. I'm sorry, my beard is looking real uh, Saddam Hussein coming out of the out of the hole here. Um, basically, uh, I was trying to pitch the idea that, how do I put this? The simplest way I could put it, that David Hayter was not passed over, well, one... I asked him if he'd ever consider the possibility, given the game we actually got, The Phantom Pain, that uh, the American version, the, the English-speaking world's version, not having the real snake uh, could somehow be part of the game, part of the whole, the Phantom Pain that you experience and all this. And it was kind of a... a I, I talked it over with Shane beforehand, and, and for some reason we both thought it was a good question, but like as soon as I asked it, I was like, this is a terrible question, because he hasn't even played the game. So he would have no idea what I'm talking about. But even even if he didn't, I sort of, I almost just wanted to put it out there that, because I, I, I don't want to uh, armchair psychologize or read into anything, but I mean, I think if I were 
Uh, this is the way I'll put it, I guess. If I were David H Hader, I would feel like I got, you know, kind of screwed over for not being allowed to come back for the last game of this character that I helped build. And it's, we didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but I mean, let's call it what it is. Like, Snake is Snake because of David. I, there, there, I don't think that the character would be the 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 the, 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 the level of popularity that Snake has. I just don't think you get it with without David Hayter. And and uh, so I I would feel hurt and upset. And I don't know. I can't say what his feelings are. He doesn't seem to be super happy about it. And all I was trying to suggest was. <laughs> That maybe there's a... Like, I, I think the circumstances were what they were, and Kojima, it's it's well documented, right? Like, he he didn't want David Hayter, for some reason, going back even to Snake Eater. Like, th he wanted to replace him with Kurt Russell. Um, so, it's that, that element, and I, it, David doesn't know that I know that, but I do know that. And I still ask the question, because even if Kojima decides that David Hayter has to go. The way that he did it, I don't think was not in light of the fact that people recognize him as Snake. So a part of the Phantom Pain being this absence of a real Snake, because we never really get a Snake or a Big Boss. We get a lot of Phantoms, a lot of people using their name and even face, but not their voice and not their essence. They're like s their soul or something. And voices are so important in phantom pain which david if you'd play it <laughs> you'd know uh but you know just letting you know so you don't have to play it they're really important and having your voice taken there's a character quiet who's been literally her voice has been taken out of her and she can't speak so your voice was taken out of the game and i just think it all fits together people can call me crazy i know i'm crazy all right so that's fine um I'm cool with that because I think there's something to this. I was pitching the idea to him. God only knows what type of shit I said and what, how the hell it came across. And I immediately backpedaled. So I'm kind of glad that some of this shit didn't actually record the right way the first time so that I could have a second chance to kind of explain myself a little better. So let's, uh, oh boy, let's just see what he says. This is at uh, 3024. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I think that the game's story was designed to make the excuse for why yeah, yes, I wasn't there. Fair. But yeah. <laughs> whether whether that worked or yeah. not, I don't know. But I haven't played the game. No, I think it is it's a good analogy for... So there's... um Not to get too far into V, but like there's a whole missing chapter called Chapter 3 Peace. And right. we, we never got the chapter and it was supposed to be the allegory for this phantom pain. Like we, we feel the pain of not getting this chapter. We never get peace. Peace day never came type B. And so in that same sense, in the English, or at least here in the West, where everyone knows you. Like when everyone... When it's almost to the point synonymous when you say snake you yeah. say david hater like say jump how i say yeah. how high it's that kind of same thing so when and you know, no hate to keeper sutherland i think he did a great job no, but at the, yeah at the same time it's that phantom pain where it's mm. like where is he like exactly. it feels like a limb got cut off but you exactly. can still feel him there and and you get like one hit of david and v where it's like and it's in a tape they do tapes again in v Oh, and really? yeah oh yeah oh yeah and uh at the very end it's ocelot and it's like um david has never left the states and all that stuff and that's the only thing you get of solid no, well, and it just hurts more well, i didn't know they mentioned him yeah oh yeah uh, I, yeah I, I no i think that it i think that he came up with the concept of phantom pain and then i got replaced and it was i think it's more unfortunate for <laughs> i think it's an unfortunate uh tie-in that I, I, I would imagine Kojima didn't want to deal with, but um, mm. uh, but who knows? I, I don't know what it, what's in the. I think you would. I think you would have killed it. Yeah, who the hell knows? That's why it's a stupid question. And, and here I, I bring up the Easter egg. You know, when you're carrying Kaz, and it's like uh, when you first rescue him, if you hit triangle. Uh, well, he says. Uh, say the magic words boss and then you say kept you waiting huh if you hit triangle even though there's no prompt 
And if you do that, he says, like, kept you waiting, huh? And it's like he's a zombie. You know, it's not Snake. It's definitely not Snake. It's the, 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 the absence of David Hayter is so strong there. And it's like, see, real quick, like, let me just try to explain a little further. I, I, I almost wanted to convey the idea that his, the way that I framed it was saying that his absence helped the Phantom Pain's themes, but if you haven't played the game, you may, that may not have been the best way for me to say that, because that may make it sound like I'm saying I'm glad he's not in it. I'm not glad that he's not in it. Um, at all. I'm not glad that it's the last was the last Metal Gear game. I'm not glad about how Konami fucking treated. Excuse me, how Konami treated Kojima. I'm not. I'm not happy about a lot of things about that game's development. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's just a it's just a testament to David's talent, is what I was trying to say. That he is the type of actor. And that is the type of character that when you make a change, it's not like nobody notices, you know? And maybe this was almost like because Kojima knows they're going to go on without him making Metal Gears. I don't know. This is honestly, this is worse than tabloid journalism. I'm just making shit up. There could be a connection there. It kind of fits when you think about it because, you know, David getting replaced a pretender coming in to play the role i mean it definitely felt like there were certain moments in phantom pain that could be read as kojima being like hey i made these games these are mine and i think that you know the idea that someday he's not going to be there um it's it's echoed in the fact that david's loss is already so so felt in that game and see now i can do my hand gestures to the camera it's great Okay, and then let's just keep rolling. Oh, jeez. It's... Okay, 33-38. Come on. Oh. Yeah, right. this is when I'm talking about the cause thing, and it's... I had nothing but just conspiracy theories in this. I should have worn a tinfoil hat. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just tried to... I, well, I yeah, know. when I tell you, like, the secret prompt, you press triangle, and, like, verbatim, he's like, kept you waiting, huh? Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, well, look, you know, I always feel that Kojima's first love is the Japanese version of the game. That's mm -hmm. his game. You know, that, you know, people are always like, what's it like working with Hideo Kojima? And I'm like, I have no idea. He, he, he didn't really play any part in the mm -hmm. English language versions. Yeah, um, that was all directed by Chris Zimmerman. So, um, so I, I, like the I, I, you know, I would just say that whatever your perspectives are on five, they should be filtered through what the Japanese version of the experience was. Because um, I think to him, the English language version is just extra. I respect so, that. So he's got, that. so he's got Akio Otsuka mm -hmm. is saying it, and in, in so. For the Japanese players, it sounds exactly like Snake, so it's it's not a big deal. And I, so I, I I just don't think I, you know I just think he wanted to hang out with Kiefer Sutherland. I don't think he really <laughs> cared about the continuity of the of the English language versions. If if he had played the game, I wonder if he'd feel the same way given the the importance of English and English taking over the world. Oh, and then I this was a good. Stop the presses. This, this was the this was the part where I uh, said maybe it was Chris Zimmerman who came up with it, which honestly makes more a little more sense because I mean, if it's like he's saying, what I was trying to say earlier was that the the Snatcher Sega CD uh, release was based on the Turbo Graphics version, and that one Kojima did work on, but he didn't touch like the localization or have anything to do with the casting any of that uh and if from what uh david is saying it sounds like that kind of thing basically held true the whole time so it could have been a decision made by chris zimmerman and this was when i shane and i both raised the idea of maybe we could have her on someday and david said he'd throw out a line and see you know if she would be amenable to that and i think that would be great because honestly chris zimmerman does not get enough credit as i would go so far as to say for those of us in the west almost as 
uh, crucial to the whole Metal Gear Solid thing as David Hayter or Hideo Kojima. Just straight up. Chris Zimmerman is a god. She's a god. Uh, unbelievable talent. I mean, just look at the quantum leap that they made. I'm talking too much now. This has become, I can just freeze them, the, the, both of them in time, and then I can just rant and rant and rant. And it's, it's my dream come true. Okay, here we go. Uh, 35, 24. Let's... In the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you so, should talk to Chris. He's great. He's got endless story. We're gonna we're gonna try our hardest to get Chris on because I think oh, well, I'll, amazing. I'll, I'll tell her. To... Oh, we love the, we love a good connection moment. We do. I love that. Um, I heard like you say on a I think it was either a podcast, a previous podcast, you had met Jordan Vogue Roberts. And oh, had drinks right, with right, him. Right, 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 right. Um, many drinks. <laughs> many drinks. Uh, and you guys talked about the upcoming Metal Gear Solid movie. We did, yeah. How was that? Because <laughs> we, we're, we are sitting here like... Let me tell you, it's gotten so bad. Dwayne The Rock Johnson just said that he's going to do a video I game movie. That, yeah. We, yeah, we don't know what movie it's going to be. I tweeted a, I quote tweeted it with a picture of Vulcan Raven and it... It became a hit tweet, and it's gotten that bad. Where we're just like, please, <laughs> and we. I just want to know, like, how that, like, just obviously, like, I know he didn't tell you, like, no secrets or nothing, but like, are how excited are you for the movie? He told me like, some secrets. I, I want to know. I know something. I can't tell you anything. <laughs> um, See me. No, I know some. I know some secrets. Uh, His big boss is dead. How did it go? It went great. Uh, it went great. He was awesome, and he's, um, you know, great brilliant director and but also really you know a super fan and 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 somebody who really respects the the world and the franchise and so i was i felt great about it i i, I think the movie's in very very good hands uh, it's just a matter of them deciding when they can put up 200 million dollars uh you know it just takes a lot to green light a movie of that size and this is a weird movie <laughs> yeah. you know it's a weird it's a weird it's a weird world to to it's not just a straight up action adventure as you know mm -hmm. it's not you know it's like uncharted is kind of a no-brainer it's indiana jones and modern day and and oh, yeah. uh but this is like you know it takes studio executives a long long time to pull the trigger on something like that yeah i guess that like goes into my next question which was uh you just coming back from spain and warrior nun season two how's mm -hmm. that going like Good. Congratulations, by the way, finishing season two. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was amazing. I got to live, got to rent, uh, rent to this beautiful apartment in downtown Madrid, and just walk to these incredible restaurants. And Warrior Nun is awesome, by the way. Sh shot a TV show in ancient crypts and mausoleums and uh, churches and castles, and it was uh, it was really astounding. And and we, you know, we really wrote the show so much bigger than we had the money for and, and so much bigger than we wrote season one uh so i'm very excited for people to see it it's just really it's it's just insane season two um yeah okay so at this part i basically you know congratulated him on his success with the show and just uh you know asked him what's it like being the voice behind one of if not the biggest characters in action games and is it tough living up to the legend of snake and mgs you know even though because david Hayter is honestly is as, as amazing as his work as snake is it's just one part of you know his career and who he is and all this stuff so um yeah, I was just asking how it feels to be Snake, basically, like, you know, the the, the man behind the voice kind of a question. So uh, let's let's back it up slightly and hear what he... So we're at 39.28. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because, you know, I mean, actors will always be more famous than writers. And but it's like, <laughs> so, you know, if I get recognized on the street, you know, nine times out of the ten, it's it's for Snake. Uh, very, very rarely do people go, aren't you that screenwriter? And, you know, um, it just doesn't, that's just not how the world works. But, but it's funny because I, public? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, sometimes, or, and like young people now are like, are you King Shark on the Flash? And so that's Love King cool. Shark. And, yeah, where's the Flash? See, um, iconic. Yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, 
So, but but it's funny because you know these games. I did nine games uh, for twelve years. It stopped ten years ago, and I, in that time, I've written fifty to sixty screenplays and television pilots. Uh, you know, had you know fifty to sixty Hollywood television or movie deals. So that's my life. You know, I get up every morning and I write for two, three hours on whatever I'm working on. I go, I either have lunch meetings or, uh, and then I do phone calls all, all afternoon. So really, my life, I'm pretty much a Hollywood uh, mogul. Yeah. You know? And 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 then I go to these conventions and I'm just solid snake to, to these folks, which you know is great. I, I you know, there's nothing better than being solid snake, but it, but it is. But it is funny because, you know, especially us on Shadow Moses uh, Cafe in the Shadow Moses Cafe, you know, people people get so intense about how did you feel about this? How did you feel about that? And I'm like, I've been humiliated so many more times since then <laughs> on, <laughs> on on much larger scales. I've had like massive movies fall apart. I've been, you know, like I, I just you know. It just doesn't reflect on my on my life, really, to say that I'm, you know, constantly affected by snake. Yeah. You know, I, I talk I talk about him a lot because of uh, because of interviews or, or cameos or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but in terms of my career, I mean, it's it's, re- it's such a small part mm-hmm. of of the overall thing, which um, which is it, which I love because. You know, I get this awesome Hollywood lifestyle, and I get to you know I drive a fancy car and have a nice house and and a pool and everything. But and I get to do movie deals. I get to work on movies. I get to go to Spain and produce a TV show. Um, but at the same time, so when I was in Spain, I got recognized I think three times over the six months I was there. Mm. I don't get recognized much because I have a mask on. But but like people <laughs> in Spain, you know, coming up to me and saying, "Oh my God, we can't believe we're meeting Snake," and so on and so on. It's really lovely. It's a, it's a it's a nice balance uh, of life and and fame, you know, rel- yeah. relative fame. I think it's pretty cool that on top of being a voice actor in these games, you're also you know you play games yourself. Uh, is that common, particularly? Would you say? Um. I, you know, I couldn't say for sure what the what the percentage is. I think a lot of the the boys do. You know, I think mm-hmm. you know people uh, of my age. You know, we all grew up playing video games. I mean, now people of every age pretty much uh, grew up playing video games, and and um, so it's not unusual anymore to see forty five year old men. You know, who are who are gamers. A lot of people in the entertainment industry do it because. Uh, you know, it keeps you in touch with modern storytelling. It's a good way to relax your brain. Um, but like Jennifer Hale doesn't play Metal Gear or, or anything like that, which is a shame because she misses out on these amazing performances she did. And yeah, she killed it, as Naomi. Oh yeah, she's well, she's the best in the world. And and um, uh, so, but for me, you know, it all goes back to my original. Uh, you know, to, to being 12 years old and saying, I want to be Indiana Jones when I grow up, you know, um, and I want to be in movies, I want to be an action hero, I want to watch my movies, and so on and so forth. And so in a small way, I get to do that with uh, with Metal Gear. I can't imagine starring in a game and not sitting down immediately to play it when it comes out, you know. That's what I would do. I always, I've always wondered that, like, if I'm voicing a game, I want to play that game, like, immediately, like, the second it comes out, like... Yeah, it's super fun, and 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 it's even more immersive for me because when he gets shot, you know, it's like <clears throat> like this, and it's my voice, and my my diaphragm seizes up <laughs> just in response because I can hear me, you know, going through pain or going through you know efforts or whatever like that. It's like an out of body experience. Almost. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's full on sense around for me. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's I think it's great fun, but um, yeah, I think. Like Elias Tufexis, I think he plays his his games, um, and uh, some of us. So some of us do, but it, but yeah, you don't hear of it too often. Or maybe people are just embarrassed to say. You know, I I sit at home playing playing with myself. I wanna I wanna know what your favorite game so far was, like the past twelve months, like that yeah, you've played. 
Uh, well, I just replayed Okami, and that's mm. my favorite game of all time. I, Let's go. I just think that's a. I just think that's an astounding, beautiful, Zen experience, and it's so Japanese, and it's so you know using the calligraphy paint to to create weapons or sword slashes or whatever, and and the fact that you're bringing life back to Japan. I I just I love that game. Uh, Okami is so good. Yeah, and then I. Uh, you know, I have I love Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit so much that I ha that I have played it consistently on my Xbox 360 for ten years, and now they just came out with a re-release version of it, and so I'm just obsessed with that. I've been playing that for a decade. Oh my god, um, which is really fun. And uh, what else? What else am I playing? I played Ghost. Tsuchima, which I thought was really beautiful. Amazing, amazing, amazing game. Maybe the most beautiful game ever. And um, uh, Miles Morales, I loved. I thought that was really fun. And the Spider-Man game was great, but I, I liked Miles Morales even more. Oh, and I played... Because, uh, uh, sorry, it was, it's like what? No, I was like, that's like an essential game. Yeah, Miles Morales. Yeah, It's great. Oh, my God. It's the style of it, the attitude, the costumes is great. And, um, and Man-Eater, which I just... I thought it was great. Is that the shark one? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I saw that everywhere. I'm like, this is the craziest game I've ever seen in my life. It's so fun. It's like, it's like you, you, you get, you know, you get born as a baby shark in the bayou and you're just like eating things, whatever. And you grow and grow and grow into this mega shark and you eventually end up in the, in the open ocean. And I, you know, I do a lot of scuba diving and I and dive with sharks and, and, with big animals and uh, like with a dive with the whale sharks and the manta rays and whatnot. Well, more and power to you. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, it's so fun and it's so beautiful. And, and so I have these dreams of just, you know, being in the ocean and it's so much like my dream that I can't, you know, I can't deal with it. It's really, I have a horrible really phobia fun. of drowning and like, I can't, I can't like be in the ocean for too long. Well, yeah, no, the ocean is a rough place if you have a fear of drowning. But. Which is funny because my husband is an officer in the Navy, so it's like he's always, we're always near the ocean. Right, right. <laughs> so I, uh, I know it's been months since this show has come out, but I have to know your Squid Game opinion. Uh, I really liked Squid Game a lot. Um, I didn't. You know, I didn't think it was perfect, but I thought it was really, uh, really fun, really creative. Some of the performances were amazing. Uh, the lead guy, the, the, the girl, and then the girl, her friend, uh, the punk girl. Sabiok. Uh, well, the punk girl and then the even punkier girl that became her friend. Oh, okay, okay. Those two, I just thought that that relationship was amazing. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I, th I, th I thought it was really fun. I mean, in a way, in some ways, it's a little goofy, but uh, uh, but I thought it was cool, and I really am, am very thrilled for their success. It was really cool to see a Korean show yeah. break out like that. I ask if he's played Deathloop, and I bring up how, like, in that game, uh, they, there's a ton of references to MGS. Like, if you try to pick up too much health uh, or too many items, the main character will say, don't be greedy, Colt, you know. Don't be greedy, snake. All right, that's really funny. I can't right, say anything. Right. I've been replaying Peace Walker, so like that's all I've been well, doing. Well, that's good. That's, oh, yeah. all, that's all you need. That's all I, the game you need. I feel kind of guilty because other than Peace Walker, I've been playing this other game called Genshin Impact, which I shit on for like a year straight. And my daughter <laughs> is seventeen, and she is obsessed with Genshin Impact. In fact, oh, now. My God. In fact, she's waiting outside my office for the moment I'm going to wrap this up so she can come in and play Genshin Impact. Are you kidding? No, I lose oh. my office every day for like <laughs> for like three hours because this is where the PlayStation is. I hope I hope she's like rolling for Zongli because Zongli just came out and I'm trying to get Zongli really bad. Oh, Natasha. No. <laughs> you know if she's rolling for Zongli. We don't know. We don't know. No. <laughs> I love um, that. I love that you called her in. <laughs> oh, she would yeah, love to I, come on here and talk about. It. She's she's in a school meeting right now, but. Uh, oh yeah, I. Uh, 
I, for like a year straight, like this game came out, I'm like, this game looks so freaking stupid. Like it's an anime game, blah, 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 like whatever. And then I finally, I was like, a bug hit me and I was like, you know what? I need something new. I'm going to play Genshin Impact. I'm just going to see what the buzz is about. I have not stopped playing for like two months straight. I, I have to I know, log in every day. She's obsessed. It's so beautiful, that game. I mean, it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. and the world is massive. I take back everything right. I said about Genshin Impact. Love it. But yeah, other than <laughs> other than that, I've been playing Peace Walker. Yeet! What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. And for this one, I basically just ask, does he have any advice for any writers who might be listening or watching? Uh, well, I, I was going to tweet this out, and then and then I decided not to. But um, you know, people ask me all the time how to deal with writer's block, and I'm like, I don't get writer's block. I have to. I have deadlines. I have to get up and get it done, or or I don't get paid. You know. Um, I wish so, I was you. No, well, <laughs> it's it's a lot easier also when it's your only job. You know, when no, you yeah. you know when you don't. I mean, if I was a mom, if I had to work another job or whatever it, it wouldn't be so easy um and it's not easy uh and so the story i was going to tell is i'm writing this uh, television pilot and i have this scene where our characters are on the road in a horse cart and they pull up to a tavern it's in the past pull up to a pub and there's going to be you know trouble there but i didn't know where the trouble was going to come from. I didn't want it to be your standard sort of scene. And I just didn't know how to go about it. But I just sat, I just sat at the computer and said, okay. And I started writing it. So the cart pulled up, they went into the restaurant. And I'm like, okay, let's see who's there. See what happens. And, and, and then, you know, there's a couple guys in the corner that just happening over here. There's some lady singing on a thing. And, and, uh, and the scene just took off on its own, you know? And, um, so that's how you get past writer's block. I think you just sit down <laughs> and start start getting into it. See where your brain see what your brain comes up with on its own. You know? Like visualize it before you write it. Well, do, no, like I that. mean if you can't visualize it before you write it, that you you start writing it, and then your brain will start popping off ideas. You know, your brain will say, you know, there's a bang in the kitchen. You're like, whoa, what the hell was that? And and you know, I don't know where that comes from. It's just you're just sort of living in the moment of that. Uh, of that scene, like improving a, a, an acting scene or something. And is it like um, pantsers vibes? Like, cause I'm a, I'm a big planner. Like, I know those planters where like they plan, but then they pants it as they go along. I don't know what that is. What's up? Oh, it's like a Stephen King euphemism or whatever, where it's like, Stephen King's a big pantser. He writes by the seat of his pants. So like he oh. sits down and he just starts writing. Like he doesn't have right, any plan. Right. He has no syllabus or anything. Oh, syllabus? What the hell's wrong with me? Anyway, like he he just goes. Yeah, there's no and outline. Then, yeah. Yeah. And so for me, I, I if I don't have thirty outlines, like for the book I'm working on right now, I have like an entire notebook of outline. And if right. I if I don't have that, I'm screwed. And yeah. so that's, I was saying like that gives me a big pantser's vibes. Like you write by the seat of your pants. Well, I try not to. I mean, I try to. Typically, um, I outline everything first um, mm -hmm. because I want I want it all in, in film structure or, or television structure or what have you. Uh, so I try to come up a detailed outline. If I'm writing a movie, then it'll be 15 to 20 pages long. And basically, if I know all the scenes. I just have to plug in dialogue and put in the specifics of the action. Um, but But sometimes... You know, you planned and you say, okay, um, at this point, there, something's going to happen. Well, when you get there, then you've got to just sort of roll and do it by the seat of your pants. But uh, yeah, Stephen King's a genius. I, you can't. You Love know, him. You can't just say, I'll, I'll do it like him because there's no brain like his. And so that leaves us with the last question or comment, whatever. And I'll tell you exactly what I told him. It was word for word. For many my age, your voice in these games did the job of parents, friends, religions, and even schools. So, on behalf of everyone whose lives your hard work and success has touched, thanks, David. Well, thank you, Jaron. That's very kind of you to say. I, I, uh, I don't like to think that I may have raised uh, thousands upon thousands of children, <laughs> but, but I guess better me than than liquid. So, oh, you well, yeah. Oh my God, can you imagine? I, oh my God, that guy. They'd all be wearing sunglasses. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. I don't want to tell my story again with like six year old me seeing this game for the first time. And just like it went on from there. But yeah, I'm very fortunate and I'm, I'm extremely, I feel extremely, again, privileged to speak with you again today. And, and I, I know it was such a small moment of your life, even though like, that you voiced all these games it took over 10 years to do or was it 16 years 12 years 12 years sorry my bad um i'm just so happy to speak with you and you you mean a lot to me and um i still i love also your tv shows your movies i still think you should be in letter kenny uh <laughs> oh i agree I, those guys L listen guys i have not forgotten my toronto accent either so <laughs> Yeah. It would be so. I am. I'm awesome. so. I'd be so honored to come on Letterkenny. Eh? You just, you just give me a shout, and I'll bring, I'll bring the booze. I would, I would love that. I watch that every time I'm cooking dinner. I just put that on, like Alexa, put on Letterkenny. So love good. it. That's the most Canadian show in history. So good, but it's such a privilege. You mean so much to me. Thank you so much for coming on Shadow Moses Cafe, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm going to. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for having me. It was so great. Thank you for your lifelong support, Shane. That really means a lot to me. And, you know, let me know. I'd love to come back. Oh, yeah, um, of course. That was pretty much it. Well, thanks for watching, you guys. I know this one was kind of unorthodox with me having to re-record, but I kind of enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you did, too. So we'll catch you next time. And thank you again, David Hader, for your time. Bye-bye.